Welcome back environmentalists for the second half of stormwater. So we're going to look at stormwater permitting first and we'll we'll look at three different types obviously and then we'll kind of close it up with the rest of the story of stormwater but we'll start with the construction permit first and there are several different types of construction stormwater permits of which we'll cover all of them they're all general permits and the first one is large a large construction site refers to any construction site that disturbs five or more acres of land or very important or here is part of a larger plan of common development. That larger plan of common development basically means it's like a subdivision or a retail area. It's something that has planned building and it's zoned for that area and it's happening all at once. So that's a larger plan of common development. So let's really define that in an LPCD known as a larger plan of common development refers to construction activity that occurs in separate stages or phases or is in uh, conducted in combination with other construction activities simultaneously all at the same time. So basically you've got this construction going on and it's disturbing five or more acres consecutively even if each individual plot of land like in a homeowner situation is like a quarter of an acre in size. There may be 30 or 40 homes being built at the same time. So when five or more acres are disturbed at the same exact time, regardless of who is disturbing the, line, uh, the land, a cumulative environmental impact occurs because there's all this land that's been exposed and cleared for building. And so when that washes off, it's not just washing off from that one uh, quarter acre home site, it's washing off from all of those 30 or 40 houses going in at the same time. This is the cumulative effect right here. So the constituent of concern, and constituent refers to a water quality constituent, something that is tested for. We're worried about dirt when it comes to construction. Sediment, dirt, or silt, they're all the same thing. These are the primary pollutant of concern at any construction site because of the following. One, they impair water quality. Well, duh, right? I mean, you can't see through the water. Well, that's going to be important to fish and aquatic plants who need photosynthesis or water clarity not to get caught by their predators. Reduces sunlight for photosynthesis in aquatic systems. Limits respiration for aquatic organisms. And can carry pollutants and excessive nutrients attached to the sediment to a water body like a lake, a river, or a stream. This is exactly that view from the sky. So it's been raining and I want you to follow this water right here and notice how the sediment is just so rich as it's feeding in. It's very thick. It's feeding into this lake. Well that lake is filling up with sediment over time and that's the fate of all lakes unless we clean them out. That's just called dredging. Very expensive for the taxpayers to do that. So Modern day, we've made all these lakes from damming up water bodies, and we're running into this problem of sedimentation. So going back to the larger plan of common development known as an LPCD, I thought I would take a subdivision that's been built out and kind of show you what it would look like uh, if we, we didn't have houses there. So if the circled house is built by a private homeowner, it's still considered a large construction site because it's part of a larger plan of common development. So this house is going in right here, but let's say all of these houses are going in at the same time. Okay. So when you look at the entire subdivision as a whole, you can see how it would disturb more than five acres, even though that one little house right back here did not. But together, they all will. So it's a cumulative effect and it has a negative impact to the environment. I like to use the example of a pecan a pie or pumpkin pie at Thanksgiving. You eat all of the pie at once. You're probably going to tip the scales a bit the next few days, weeks, or maybe even a month. If you spread the eating of that entire pie over the course of a month, and you're exercising regularly and you're not exceeding your caloric intake, you're not going to gain weight. But you will if you if you have it all at once and you don't control that caloric intake. So it's the same analogy used for the environment. So if the subdivision is built by multiple construction companies, so I put four construction companies here, each company's construction site may not disturb five acres total, 
but they're individually considered a large construction site because they each contribute sediment to the environment from the same holistic area. So in other words, from the same subdivision. Because remember, these houses haven't been built out yet. It's just, this is an established one in the picture. I'm just trying to give you an image of where the houses would be and the construction would look like. So each individual lot contributes to the big picture. So each one of these companies would be or require a large construction uh, permit. So what is a small construction site? These refer to any construction site that disturbs one to five acres and is not, keyword is not, part of a larger plan of common development. So how and when would that occur? Um, typically it occurs when you've got a house or a business that's gone in in an area where there's not much construction. So let's say somebody buys some rural property and wants to put in a corral, a building uh, to house horses, uh, you know, in-law house and their main house. And they're disturbing a total of three acres. So they would qualify as a small construction site and not a large construction site because they're not in part of a larger plan of common development. There is such a thing as a non-regulated construction site. These are those that refer to any construction site that is less than one acre of land that's disturbed and is not part of a construction site that is in a larger plan of common development. Where and when would this happen? Same kind of scenario as my rural house. Um, you buy a lot and you're building something on less than an acre and there is no common plan of development. So these last two items, small and non-regulated, don't happen as often as the largers do. And we're to a point now where I think the regulated construction industry pretty much knows that and have come to accept that there is a difference between large and small because when these rules came out and actually got implemented at the state level, it took years for them to actually adjust to that, that they weren't all small uh, entities or non-regulated uh, stormwater sites. They really were large sites. So what are the re permit requirements for construction stormwater? First of all, both large and small construction sites are required to have a site notice, remember that from last lecture, at or near the main entrance of their site. This is to inform the public, should there something go wrong, who to contact. And I gave you my example of the friend that I had. Large construction sites are also required to post one more thing in addition to their site notice. They're required to uh, post their notice of intent, their NOI. We learned about that in the last lecture. So it has to be side by side next to the site notice and that also tells them what the permit number is, the public, uh, what the regulating entity is uh, that's regulating that site and so forth. All regulated construction sites are required to write and maintain and update their stormwater pollution prevention plan. Remember that term known as the SWIP? Before, before, really, before they apply for the general permit, not after. <laughs> because when you sign that dotted line on the NOI, it says you're already in compliance. So if you make the SWP3 after you've signed that, you're not in compliance and that's breaking the law. So the stormwater pollution prevention plan is not required to be submitted to the EPA or a state department of environmental quality for approval because it's a living document. It stays on site. It changes on a regular basis at a construction site it should be like daily because they have a requirement to maintain a site map with their best management practices. And the idea is the updates help minimize pollution because the company is checking their best management practices for effectiveness, keeping track of them like this person is right here with their foreman to make sure that their best management practices are in compliance. Large construction sites are required to inspect their best management practices on a set schedule that is in and outlined in their stormwater pollution prevention plan or SWEP. The general permit allows for two options. Option one, the site or large construction site is required to inspect their, their construction site every 14 calendar days and, big word and there, within 24 hours of a qualifying rain event of 
0.5 inches or more. That and part is kind of a bummer if you've got like 10 construction sites going on and you're on vacation and it rains. Uh, let's just say that it's a holiday weekend and it rains on Thursday, it rains on Friday, it rains on Saturday, it rains on Sunday. you got to go out every time within 24 hours, even though you're on vacation. So I personally think a better option, except during really dry seasons like the summer, might be every seven calendar days and it's not after a qualifying rain event. So if you do the, your inspection on your site the same day that you, every week, and you list that in your stormwater pollution prevention plan, that means your best management practices and your construction site are being reviewed more often, and you don't have to worry about getting out there after a qualifying rain event. The ultimate goal of the site inspection is when you have some kind of best management practice bailing like this silt fence is right here, that you fix it in a timely manner. So the next time it rains, we don't have more pollution going to the environment. Because remember, you can't stop all pollution, but you can reduce a majority of it. The best management practices are required to be implemented at the construction sites, and their sole purpose is to slow down the flow of water, which keeps the sediment on the construction site and the water flowing off the site. So stormwater rules do not mandate the use of specific BMPs at the federal level, not even at the state level. But the local level might actually have an ordinance that does require a specific best management practice. It's really up to the operator to implement and maintain the best man management practice of their choice that best suits their site and their financial budget. So it's just a matter of what they can do and what they want to do. But the goal is they must have BMPs that are effective. So I'm going to look at a couple of best management practices and show you what they are. And this is just a handful to kind of give you an overview of what BMPs look like and what their function is. First one's a silt fence, pretty easy concept. You put in this mesh stuff and put something to anchor it in and the mud gets held on one side and doesn't flow off the site so that the water does. So a BMP is made of mesh and anchored to the ground which slows down the flow of water allowing for silt and mud to accumulate on one side of the fence while allowing the water to pass by the other side. These are required to be replaced after the sediment builds up like you see in this picture behind one side because the fence or if the structure becomes ripped or torn. Because if the fence falls down or it becomes ripped or torn, it's not going to be effective anymore. So if you're using a silt fence or any kind of best management practice, it needs to be managed and it needs to be practiced. So uh, important. This is a rock berm, a type of best management practice. You can see they've used rocks and kind of anchored them in with the uh, uh, chain link fence material there and these are piles of rock that actually slow the flow of water down. These are hay bales and they're protecting uh, ground inlets right here for stormwater. So basically the hay bales achieve the same goal as the rock berm or the silt fence. They stop the water and mud from getting into the storm drain. That's all that they do. A drain gate cover is a more expensive best management practice but achieves the same goal. It is actually made of plastic and it fits on top. It's uh, actually designed to anchor in place and cover the entire uh, grill that you see there, our, our drain, drain gate cover. And there'll usually be a, several of these over the drains and then they're anchored down and prevent water and mud from getting in. Mesh or geotextiles is another name for it. These are BMPs made of mesh, usually impregnated with grass seeds to slow the erosion of exposed ground when it rains. And ultimately, they'll help in the development of final stabilization where grass will grow and you won't have raw sediment anymore. That's important to you closing your, set, your construction site. These are stormwater socks, one of my favorite best management practices. I just think they're neat. And they can come in a fabric, or in this case, hay. And uh, they slow down the flow of water. And this is an inlet structure right here where uh, stormwater would just run in and slip under the, the ground. And uh, it just slows down the water and stops it. The, the sediment on one side and lets the water pass through the other. All the best management practices work the same. They're just designed in a little bit differently in their shape. So permitted construction sites are required to achieve final stabilization prior to terminating their stormwater coverage. And if you remember, we learned about term, uh, terminating 
If you remember, we learned about terminating a construction site using a notice of termination or a not. So in order to achieve final stabilization, this means that the entire site, construction site that was permitted, is 70% or more covered with vegetation impervious cover, meaning like pavement, asphalt, concrete, and, or permanent structures or control of the site is transferred to another site operator. So maybe there were several people building on the same construction site. That operator, whoever did the groundwork, may turn it over to whoever does the foundation, and they may turn it over to the electrical, who may turn it over to the exterior. So it could go into a series of phases like that. So let's move into the industrial multi-sector general stormwater permit requirements. A little bit more on this one, um, more complex, but still not very hard to follow. The industrial multi-sector general stormwater permit requirements are permit requirements that apply to 29 very specifically identified sectors that EPA has selected and identified as having significant potential to discharge pollution or contaminated stormwater. These sectors are coded using standard industrial classification codes, SIC codes. This system is a short numerical code that corresponds to a book containing detailed descriptions of industrial activities. And the North American Industrial Classification System, known as NAICS, is that book. So if you were to look up a school, or you were to look up a post office, or you look up a construction site, or you look up a repair shop, or you look up a car wash, they'd all have a very specific number and very specific description. So there's a, a standard industrial classification book, and then there's the NAICS system. And the North American Indu Industrial uh, Classification System is the most recognized has the same numbers as the SIC, but it's the more updated version of the two. So if an industrial's SIC, standing for Standard Industrial Classification Code, is listed in the industrial MSGP, which stands for Multi-Sector, right up here, General Stormwater Permit, MSGP, Multi-Sector General Permit, such as 3411. So if you look at 3411, that's metal, uh, cans. That's a producer of metal cans, okay? Not just metal cans in general. It's the SIC code for people who manufacture metal cans. And then you come up here and you can see that in the red, they're required to do the permit. But let's look at 5812. 5812 is a retail place. It's not listed in the permit. So if it's not listed in the permit, it doesn't have to do anything. They're exempt from stormwater requirements. So the bottom line is your SIC code for your business must be listed in the industrial multi-sector general permit in order to even have to worry about it. It's kind of like going back to waste and product in the waste lecture. If it's a product, it's kind of off your screen. That's kind of how not having your SIC code and the stormwater permit for the industrial permit works. So if it's not there, Yay! But if it is there, you've got to worry about it. So there are three options once you discover your SIC code. Again, SIC stands for Standard Industrial Classification Code. So once you discover your, your SIC code is in the multi-sector general permit, the three options are as follows. No discharge. That means the site will never ever have a discharge even during an act of nature, which is like a, a big giant flood. Number two, they have no exposure. And that means the facility certifies the site will not cause pollution or no exposure 100% of the time, rain or shine. That's a hard one to do. The last one is they know they have a discharge when it rains, so they got to apply for the general permit. So you can imagine most opt for number three, but a few try to do number one and number two. So once a facility determines they cannot meet no discharge, because very, very uh, seldom that that happens, you could, in theory, have a hole in the ground deep enough to deal with a 20-inch flood. I had that happen when I worked at TCEQ. An inspector sent me out to a site uh, out in the country. The guy had dug like a 15-acre retention pond, and he said, Now, honey, 
If it were to be a 20 inch rain, this area is going to be buried and TCEQ Region 9 is going to be completely underwater. I don't think they're going to care if I have permit coverage. I had to laugh and I was like, you got a point, but nevertheless, I'm still here to inform you that if there were to be an act of nature where you had this unbelievable flood, you would still be uh, required to have permit coverage and you'd be out of compliance. He said, I don't, I'm fine with that. He said, I'm, I'm claiming no discharge. He's the only site I've seen that's done that. I've seen more people try to apply for no exposure and most of them can't meet it, but I've seen a handful that actually do. So if you can't meet no discharge or no exposure, you have to apply for the general permit for the industrial uh, multi-sector general permit. What is required of you once you apply? Well, really it's before you apply. Develop a SWIP, which is the same as what you saw for construction. It's a stormwater pollution prevention plan written for industrial activities. You must implement, maintain, and yes, inspect your best management practices for effectiveness. Number three, you submit a notice of intent after you've done those things above that. And then on an annual basis, you assess how your site is working. Are your best management practices doing their job? Um, do you need to modify that? Is it merited to do so? Or is everything working on as it should? So it's a pretty simple process. All permitted facilities in terms of monitoring are required to conduct environmental monitoring if they have applied for the permit. However, facilities that are no discharge and no exposure sites do not have any environmental monitoring. Okay, None. There's no reason for them to. So if you have applied for the permit, here's what you're going to have to do. Everyone has to do one and two on the top, which is quarterly visual monitoring, which we talked about in the definitions. And that happens during qualifying rain event, basically to make sure there's nothing weird about the way your rainwater looks or smells or characteristics of it. Number two, you have to conduct heavy uh, annual metals monitoring, which basically means this. You're testing for a list of heavy metals that EPA has identified as high risk metals. And you can opt out of all, some, or a handful of metals if you don't have them on your site. You simply write it in your plan. Now, about half of our permitted facilities have additional monitoring requirements to the top. So here's what they would have to do in addition. And they find that in the second half of the permit. The first one they may have to do is benchmark monitoring. The second one they may have to do is effluent monitoring. Truly, there's only a small fraction of the 29 sectors that have to do effluent monitoring, and over half have to do benchmark. But if they do benchmark, they may also have to do effluent. You're not going to find an effluent without a benchmark. So what's the difference? Benchmark basically means that you take four samples throughout the year during what's considered a quarter. So quarters are January, February, March, with peak quarter one, April, May, June, quarter two, July, August, September, quarter three, and the remainder of the year, quarter four. And it's an average of your numbers. An effluent monitoring is a number for that quarter. If you bust it once, you're out of compliance. So it's in tune with what a wastewater treatment plant would have to worry about. They bust their, their limits, they're, they're out of compliance. Same thing with a public drinking water plant. So let's look at the last of the general permits called the Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System Permit Requirements, known as an MS4. Again, the S4 is for S, 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 S. Separate Storm Sewer System. And let's look at their permit requirements. So municipal separate storm sewer system means that you have a sewer pipe that is not combined and commingled with a storm drain pipe. In other words, they don't go to the same place. The sewer pipe is going to a sewer plant known as a wastewater plant. The storm drain goes directly untreated to rivers, lakes, and streams or coastal waters, depending on where it discharges to. So what is an MS4 by definition? They're publicly owned and operated MS4s, municipal separate storm sewer systems that could include, but not limited to, ditches, curbs, gutters, storm sewer lines, other conveyances, and any similar means of collecting runoff to reduce flooding. So basically that's the goal with an MS4. These would be things like MS4s right here. They're ways to move rainwater off the streets. 
that's the bottom line to reduce flooding which is another reason why we don't put trash and dump in these things right here because it reduces the ability of the storm drain to do its job. So there are two types of MS4s. There are large and small. An MS4 uh, has that's large has an urbanized area of concentrated population with a population of 100,000 or greater. And there's a formula that's used to determine what is a large regulated MS4 versus a small regulated MS4. So what's a small? It's an urbanized area, UA, urbanized area, with a population less than 100,000 or an outside area, uh, outside of the urbanized area, identified on a case-by-case -case basis. So in this map right here, you can see that this is a stormwater map showing you a county. And the dark area, basically, folks, is unincorporated areas. But you can see how the legend reads areas that are urbanized and areas that are not. So the areas that are within the urbanized section, whether or not they're a city or not, still have to have an MS4 permit which means they've got to do a slew of things. They have to have an inspection program for their industrial and construction sites within those areas. They've got to have an enforcement person, so that means they have to hire somebody, you usually have a car dedicated for them to get out and see sites. And they have to enforce against construction and industrial facilities if they're non-compliant, which is not really what you want to do as a city because you want that business to stay where it is. It's expensive, no doubt, if you become a a uh, small regulated MS4 is not a happy day. Large ones have known for a long time, uh, and the large ones in Texas would be ones all the big cities, and uh, there were like over 20 of them. So regulated MS4s are required to do the following. They have to identify their sources of pollution, so they got to find where the industrial and the construction sites are, where the residential causes of pollution are. They have to mitigate, which means they have to enforce against it. They have to conduct monitoring to quantify the pollution levels and the sources. That means they have to have a sampling program. They have to enforce against entities such as construction sites or industrial facilities or citizens, even who may over uh, fertilize their yard or people who dump their oil down, an oil, uh, down a storm drain. And they have to perform public education about stormwater pollution and prevention. So you may have seen something like this in the past and on a storm drain. Well, that storm drains stenciling. That's part of their education and mitigation program. So let's get to our science servings. We're always happy about science servings, aren't we? Because it means we're towards the end of the lecture. So in our science serving, every major city has a stormwater program. And you will see evidence of their educational programs in unique places like this. For example, here's the city of Houston. See where it says storm sewer? That's a lid, a manhole to access the storm sewer. So that tells you if it's a storm drain, a water drain, like a PWS, a public drinking water drain, or if it's a wastewater drain, you'll see the names on it. The EPA started regulating stormwater back in around 1990. So up until then, they only regulated point source discharges like from wastewater plants instead of non-point source pollution like stormwater. So we're going to watch a little video over sanitary sewer overflows, SSOs, and what FOG is. And that stands for fats, oils, and grease, guaranteed test question. Fog is regulated by the government and is documented by conducting camera inspections inside of that pipe. So 75% of sanitary sewer overflows, or SSOs, are attributed to grease and debris from storm events. So let's take a peek at this. This message is brought to you by New Castle County and me, Perry the Pipe, urging you to cease the grease. Dumping grease down the kitchen sink? Think again. Hot water and your garbage disposal won't do the trick. When you put fats, oils, and grease, or fog, down the kitchen sink, grease doesn't just go away. It cools and hardens, which can affect both you and your neighbors. This could mean a blocked sink, expensive plumbing repairs, and even backed up sewage on your property. Yuck! Grease can also cause blockages in sewer lines, property damage, foul odors, and road closures due to pesky pipe repairs. 
Sometimes backed up sewage has nowhere to go but through pipe breaks or manholes, and may even drain into our lakes and rivers. This is why Newcastle County is encouraging residents to cease the grease and put fog where it belongs. Cooking oil, butter, bacon grease, salad dressing, and even your leftover pizza should never be put down the drain. Instead, pour the fog into a sealable container and throw it away when it's full. And before you put your dirty dishes in the sink, wipe off excess grease with a paper towel and throw the paper towel in the trash. Large amounts of cooking oil can be recycled into biofuel. Proper disposal prevents grease buildups from blocking sewer lines, keeps your pipes clear, and protects Newcastle County. So do your part and cease the grease, because it doesn't stop at the kitchen sink. A little cheesy, I know, but fun, because it totally tells the story of what happens with fat soils and greases known as fog in our sewer lines. So you may not live in that county, obviously, but it's a message that every uh, MS4 has to share with their citizens is the unfortunate story about clogged drains because of fog, fats, oils, and grease. So as we leave for the day, one more video, and we will conclude with our final thoughts. What happens when you build up fats, oil, and grease? If you answered pounds, you're right. This is pounds of untreated raw sewage draining into our sewer system properly. But this is untreated sewage getting backed up in our sewer pipes. Raw sewage that can flow onto the streets and into our ocean. I've heard some horrific stories. The sewer lines plugged up and just backing up into the sewer system into the streets. A lot of times that will get into the gutters, sometimes into the catch basins, and unfortunately sometimes it can leak to the beach. Built up fats, oils, and grease, also known as fog, caused more than 20 sewer overflows in Long Beach in 2010. When the Long Beach Water Department instructed me that I had a problem, I was in denial. I'm sure that there are restaurants that use grease more than we do and gets into the sewer lines and uh, creates a problem, creates havoc. When fats, oil, and grease are poured into the sink, they eventually begin to stick to the sides of the pipe. Over time, as more and more fog accumulates, it can start to clog the inside of the pipeline. If it gets bad enough, fog can completely block a city pipe, preventing any sewer flow through the pipe. Once this happens, sewer flows have nowhere to go but up, most often overflowing through a manhole and then heading downstream to the nearest storm drain. Once in the storm drain system, this unsanitized raw sewage then makes its way into the ocean, which can cause major public health issues and pollution. In the cleanup, it can start off at $20,000, and the city will tack 35% on that. And when that happens, these guys have to do the dirty work. This is another heavy grease area, and you can see that the grease is built up all the way around the pipe as it's actually blocking the hammer from doing its inspection. If sewage should happen to get into the ocean, there's really no way of recovering. You cannot disinfect the ocean completely. And there are many types of fog that you may not be aware of. Cooking oil, butter, margarine, lard, bacon, steak fat, meat, cheese, and yogurt, different sauces, gravies, salad dressing, deep fried dishes like french fries. So here's how you can keep fog out of your system, out of your sewer system, that is. We would like to practice BMP, best management practices. You cannot put grease in your sinks. Wipe out your pots and pans, put the paper towels in your trash, pour your grease in the can, dispose of the trash. Now for restaurants, they have to have a device, a interceptor or a grease trap. They can vary from prices from 200 to $3,000. So do not put grease in your sink wash it down to our main. Appreciate that. So if you were just totally grossed out by that, that was yummy, wasn't it? With all the grease and the rat in the, in the drain there. It's a reality in every city, not just there. So where you live, I promise, fat soils and grease, it is a problem where they live. Bottom line, as we leave this lesson is, remember that stormwater never gets treated, and that's why it's regulated. So kind of put a new lens on when you're thinking about rainwater and understand that when it rains, what ends up on the ground goes in here and ends up there. And so it ends up in our waterways untreated. And that's the whole reason we have the program. So our concluding 
really motivating thought for the day, right? Government, if you think the problems we craft are bad, just wait until you see our solutions. Unfortunately, there's some truth to that when we have some solutions that aren't working so well, like regulations or the inability to carry them out. So I just hope that you left with a better understanding of stormwater and understanding that we regulate stormwater or the government requires that it be regulated because we need to preserve our water resources across the United States. I'll see you at the next lecture. Bye.